Uh, thank you, Heather. Yes, so I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us on this um, lovely Sunday afternoon. Uh, my name is David Storch, and my, my uh, association with Tarragon goes back to 1987 when I first came to Toronto. Um, I'm going to say some things that some of you will be very familiar with, but I'm, I'm uh, doing this for the benefit of people who might know and people who are uh, going to join us in the future at Sunday online. Thank you very much for joining us uh, digitally. So the, the Tarragon is a very important and exciting place because it develops new work. And we'll talk quite a bit about that today. It's, a, it's a, got a special place in Morris's life and in the life of the nation's theatrical development uh, because of his dedication to incubating and cultivating playwrights and their work. Um, it's also a really exciting place to be as an actor. And I know when I first got here, I was so excited to meet all of these new playwrights and to do uh, afternoon-long workshops, day-long workshops, week-long workshops, public readings, private readings, all kinds of stuff, and to feel like I, I had a, a sort of toehold in, um, in, in the world of creating new work by Canadian playwrights. Um, I've, in the years since, I've uh, performed here a number of times and have continued to do work developing new work. So Morris uh, has a connection here going back to 1982, not as a playwright, but as a performer. He was cast by Larry Lillo in an, a rel relatively unusual piece for the Tarragon to do. It was the Rogers and Hart musical Pal Joey and, and Morris played Pal Joey, right? That was your first Tarragon gig, right? Um, that would have been where he met the recently installed new artistic director, Urjo Carreta, and I'm guessing that you two probably talked about your uh, ambitions as a playwright in those days. Yes, among other things. Yes, yes. among other things. Um, Ur Urjo was uh, a, an amazing, um, intelligent person who did so much to foster not just playwrights, but designers and directors and, and lighting designers because he really, he was an incredibly intelligent person. Um, he was uh, incredibly insightful about what was good about a playwright, what was good about the playwright's work, but he was also, um, any, any of you who know him may have, have encountered uh, him as someone who was just in awe of people who got up on stage and performed or created plays. So the, this led to uh, Morris being sucked into that, that part of the Tarragon's um, uh, activities here, and eventually Ends of the Earth was first, right? No, no? Seven Stories. So Seven Stories, which was a, a very um, critically acclaimed popular work for the young Morris Panitch. Seven Stories, Ends of the Earth, Lawrence and Holloman, Anatole, Girl in the Goldfish Bowl, Sextet, uh, Dishwashers, help me, they're like... Earshot. The, earshot, yeah. Um, and, and at least a couple more that will probably... Benevolence, the much hated be benevolence. Benevolence. Um, <laughs> right, and he's also um, directed a couple of shows that he did not write. Uh, Joan McLeod's 2000. Um, and in 19... I think 94, um, White Biting Dog, which was the 10th, weirdly, the 10th anniversary uh, commemorative production right. of White, Judith Thompson's White Biting Dog. And it being a playwright's theater, Judith was there in rehearsal a lot and still like tinkering with it, things that she was unsatisfied with maybe 10 years later, things she wanted to change to update it, right? Um, and that is where Morris and I first met, our first collaboration. Since then, we've worked together many times in many different sorts of shows, many different capacities, uh, and have been um, friends for a, a long time. You'll probably hear us mention Ken today. And when we do that, we're talking about Ken McDonald, who is in the back row there with the baseball cap and the glasses. Ken is not only Morris's husband, but his probably most frequent uh, trustworthy collaborator. Um, beginning, like I know you guys knew each other before that, but, but uh, their first show that they did together, I believe, was, oh, you designed Pal Joey. I did. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, Morris and wrote a play in collaboration with Ken called Last Call, which was a two-person um, cabaret 
on the theme of nuclear annihilation. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the cheery start of Morris's life <laughs> as, as a playwright. Um, so that's why we're um, talking with him today as part of the Tarragon Talks series. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to start off with some, as I promised, them, some real uh, softball questions. So <laughs> the, if, you, um, if you get a chance and you haven't done so yet, there's a, a 10, maybe it's, no, five minute uh, video that was shot by Mike, who's on the camera here today, where Morris is sitting in Withrow Park answering some general questions about the play and how it got to the tarragon. So I encourage you to watch that if you haven't yet. I watched it and learned that you first started writing this play in 2015. About then, yeah. My experience of you talking about plays is that you tinker with them in your head for a long time and you'll tell me, I've got this idea for a play about these two guys, or maybe three guys, no, probably two guys, and this woman and they do this thing and so I think I'll write that, I'll start that next week and two weeks later you have a draft. That's, is that typically, that's how it seems to me. Uh, well, if I, if I feel like I'm ready to write the play, but that's a long process too, because I have to feel like there's the right moment. Like, weirdly, this time of year is a really good time to write a play for me, because, especially if there's a, but I have to make sure there's like a period of about three weeks ahead of me where I have no distractions. And then once I feel like I'm ready, I'll just get, I'll just knock out a first draft really fast, as quickly as I can, because I need to get it all down on paper, and then I can start playing around with it and messing around with it. But just for me, it's about getting the first part of it done. So yeah, Withrow Park, I think I had an idea and then I, then I tinkered with it. I, as David says, I have in, in my computer, I have well, now, it used to be on pieces of paper everywhere, but now in my computer I have files of different ideas that I'm playing with and then I'll revisit them every once in a while and think, Could that, is that a play yet or is that gonna be anything or should I bother with it or, and so, and then at some point I'll think, I think I have a beginning and I think I have an end and I think I have a middle so maybe I'll just start and then I just go. <clears throat> so you, you wrote that or started writing this uh, pre so many things including COVID. Yeah. How has it evolved in the time since you first Well I don't think class? COVID if, if affected it that much except that it wasn't produced. <laughs> uh, nothing was. Um, but I, I don't think it, I don't think the material was affected that much by COVID because I think kind of weirdly it just kind of like kind of was kind of a post COVID play, but that's because I tend to write on themes of alienation and loneliness yeah. and isolation. And so the COVID I think just kind of, um, made everybody else feel that too. <laughs> Um, a, a lot of this, this is one of those comments I, I just feel like I, I need to make, um, which will be obvious to some of you, maybe, hopefully news to some of you. Um, when we say that the Tarragon is a writer's theater, one of the things that the Tarragon has that most theaters don't have is a very generous amount of previews, right, which allow the playwright and, of course, the director and the actors to spend more time making the play better. Uh, lots of theaters produce world premieres of plays, but they don't tend to alter their model of rehearsal, technical, preview, open, because they're doing a new play. Here, you've had a chance to see the play already a handful of times and a few more times before the opening. What's that process been like on this show? Uh, tricky. Um, it's good to get an audience response, but because, uh, I think because of the, uh, how, how tricky it is for the actors to absorb new information, it, it, I have to be very careful what new, new bits I put in the show, how much I uh, rearrange things. It's easier to do in the middle of rehearsal to kind of like, you know, for example, if I have big cuts to do, even little changes, like I can't really, for example, if I had little changes today that I wanted to make, I can't go back there and talk to the actors about them because I think it would throw them. They'd get to that section of the play and they would, they would kind of like be so what we're trying to do now during the previews is get the actors loose enough and kind of used to doing the show and 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 kind of like forget about the you know the rehearsal process and forget about trying to learn the lines and just try to play the show as naturally as they can so that it feels right for them and for the audience so it is tricky because if you do want to make changes you have to make them kind of judiciously and carefully at this point and 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 then even Jackie, who's directing it, Jackie Maxwell, she's saying to me even yesterday, that's it, you can't make any more. <laughs> we, had a, we actually had a little bit of a thing on the phone because I said, well, Jackie, you know, it is a new play and this is a writer's theater. 
And she's like, I know, but the actors, you know, and you remember, you wrote a play about old people and they're old. <laughs> and, they, and, <laughs> and they have a hard time remembering their lines, so don't give them any new ones. And so, you know, you have to be careful how you, how you, you know, do that. So I think it, the thing about, you know, there have been a couple of workshops of this, of, this, uh, of this piece and, you know, like short workshops of maybe a day where the actors will get together and then they'll read the play and talk a little bit about it and I'll go away and I'll rewrite according to that. But when you're rehearsing, it's a whole different process, as you know, because then suddenly you see problems that arise because the actors go much deeper into the material. They start asking questions that they wouldn't ask during a workshop uh, because they're actually now playing the parts and they have to make sense out of them. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting and tricky because also I write in a very different way than a lot of writers. My writing is a, a kind of style that actors have to get their heads into. And so I, I you know, it's, it's not naturalistic writing. <clears throat> okay, so, th so this brings up an interesting point because uh, um, a, a style that actors have to get their heads into. And there are a few people here, including Ken and Nora, uh, who have seen Morris perform on stage. I directed him in Yasmina Reza's art, and I thought he was excellent as uh, Serge, the guy that buys the white painting. But I also saw him in, is it called Last Days of Judas Iscariot or Trial? Do you remember? I can't remember what that play is called. Last Days of Judas um, Iscariot. And Morris was just, the only two times I've seen him act, and I can say that he's a brilliant actor. How does acting inform your work as a writer? Well, one of the things that I, I always loved as an actor, because I was mostly a, I was a very good comic actor, and one of the things I really loved was making sharp turns, and quick sharp turns that were kind of inexplicable, and, uh, and, so, and I became very good at it, and then, so when I write, I like to write that way. It means actors have to kind of pick up on that energy and be able to move very swiftly through material, changing direction. Um, so that was one of the, I think that's one of the things that's affected me. I also think that, Practically speaking, I can hear the voices of actors. I, I know what their process is. I can guess what their questions might be mm -hmm. about the play ahead of time. So hopefully some of those are answered. But sometimes you don't want to answer those questions because first of all, sometimes those are questions that the actor needs to ask themselves and that the actor has to prepare the material uh, for themselves in their own way. I can't really help them except and 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 sometimes if you help the actor too much you're you're kind of like wrecking your play in a way you're 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 kind of diminishing the power and the and the uh, the um the spark of your play by trying too hard to help the actors out and sometimes you don't want to help the audience either sometimes you think the audience needs to figure things out the audience you know it's it's part of the fun of of watching plays or part of the fun of any kind of uh, medium like you know even film and television is to guess what's going on or to try and figure things out and sometimes it's just not to know. And when you talk about uh, the actors needing to negotiate their way into your style, you, you talked about the fast turns, is it also a matter of helping them find your sense of humor for want of a better word? Like where, where the, sorry, that's a bad way of saying it, the, where the the humor of the piece lives? Yeah, I mean, like, I'll give you an example. Uh, the great Brent Carver, who's a great, great actor, uh, we were working on Vigil together at, uh, at Canadian Stage, and Brent was like, at one point I said to him, I, I don't get this scene, I just, you're being, you're being so nice to her. And he said, I just, I can't be mean. And I was like, mm, you really don't get me. <laughs> yeah. like, mean is my thing. And mean isn't necessarily uh, hateful. No. It's just a style. It's just a, it's just a, I think I got it mostly from my mother, pro probably, just kind of really tough, nasty, kind of like sarcasm, irony, stuff that I was used to and I'm used to, and it's kind of like, for me, it's funny. For other people, it's like, maybe not so funny. <laughs> well, but so I think that at one point, uh, the, the promotional material for this afternoon's talk said something about dark comedy in the Canadian theater or something like that. And so I, I, I thought for a little bit, what is dark comedy? And if we're talking about things that are, uh, I don't know, caustic, biting, sort of morbid, maybe absurd, maybe things that, that don't make light of or laugh at how tough life can be, things that find the humor in just how miserable life can be at times. So then it seems to me that there's 
dark comedy, and then there are things that just aren't funny. Right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very thin line. You, you may find that out today. <laughs> but, you know, you have to, I think you have to negotiate your way through that very carefully. I mean, now is a, it's a tricky time now, too, because uh, the world is shifting very quickly, and uh, people's sensitivities are changing, and the subject material is changing, the things you can't talk about, and things you can talk about. And so, you also have to negotiate your way through that because there's thing, there are things I still want to talk about. There are things I don't want to be afraid to talk about and things I don't, don't want to be afraid to say. And so, you, you know, you have to find, navigate your way through that. I, there's one instance uh, I had to, I didn't have to cut this line, but we were, um, I made a joke about a, 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 a child's doctor. There's a, in the play, there's a, there's a reference to a, a pediatrician and I made a joke about him something i don't know acting like a woman or something and 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 um jackie's like she want she said i i think maybe we sh you should think about cutting that line because it's really turning people off and i said is it because of the woman thing and he said she said no it's because of the pediatrician thing because any association with pediatrician now is kind of uncomfortable and i'm like really and i can't make fun of a pediatrician and so and then and then i just started thinking about that you know I, it's not even worth it it's not even that funny a joke so I'll just get rid of it. But you do have, you know, find you're traveling through you know, a certain kind of political correctness. But as a, as a kind of a dark comic writer who looks at the absurd side of life, uh, I have to go there. I mean, I go there in my own mind. And I think, what makes, I, I think what makes my writing work is that people recognize in themselves dark feelings and secret feelings they have in their own minds about things that come out in the play, you know, like Vigil's a good example of like how people uh, just want their relatives to die. And, 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 it's, and it's, it's kind of a truism, and that's why people laugh. It's like, you know, because they recognize the horrible nature of what life really presents to them, which is that people die, that people get old, that get sick, and they die. And that's, that's just, that's, Irrevol I didn't invent that. That, that, <laughs> that wasn't my idea. And so I just, I'm just responding to that idea. And I'm also responding to the idea that my internal feelings are, the truth is, I don't, you know, obviously I don't want my relatives to die, but there are moments where you think, why don't you just die? Um, and it just becomes more and more difficult as people become older. And, and now, especially, you know, friends of mine and uh, uh, going through this critical time where, you know, your, you know, your family, your loved ones, your parents, you know, it gets to a point where you, you're, there's your, your, your public thought is, you know, something different than your private thought. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do as a writer is tap into the private thoughts. Um, so you've written quite a few plays now. Do you know how many? Have, do you have a number? Um, well, I've written 40. Wow. I think it's about 40. Some of them are adaptations. And there's about, I don't know, there's about three of them that have never been done. Um, is Mike Payette here? <laughs> um, uh, and then I, and then there's, there's several plays that haven't actually ever been in Toronto, but have been other places. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I think about 40 plays. Wow. Do you feel that your mm. process, I, I feel making theater as uh, actor and director it gets simpler as time goes by, but also harder, in part because I'm more aware of all the different things that could go wrong at any given moment. Does, pl does your playwriting process get easier as you do more of it? Um, it's tricky. I mean, I think the actual nuts and bolts of writing the play get easier, but the actual finding of material and digging into for material gets harder because I kind of... Ex Oh, I go, I've explored that, I've done that, or I've said that, or I don't need to say that again, or I need to find a different way of saying that. I'm looking for new ways to talk about things. I'm looking for new things to talk about. So that part gets harder. I think the actual execution of playwriting is uh, that I love. I mean, once I'm into the material, once I'm deep into it and rewriting it, I really, that's when I'm the most happy yeah. about writing. Um, okay, so speaking of new, th new things, um, I forget what the work was that you adapted without text at Studio 58. What was that? The first one? Yeah. It was called Nocturne. And um, so, so m 
Morris, in collaboration with a few other artists, including Ken, has, has this, uh, this body of work that is without text. So it, it's dramaturgy. It's, it's a, a story set to music, fa famously um, The Overcoat, which had like a huge success across the country and uh, internationally. Uh, most recently, Frankenstein at the Stratford Festival. Uh, the story of that um, Mary Shelley book told without words. So not dance and obviously not uh, spoken drama or, or singing. Um, do, do, did that, does that process do much to inform how you look at your plays with text? Do you look at them and think? Well, yeah, because there's a lot you can, there's a lot of storytelling you can do without words. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the great ironies in my life that one of my most successful pieces as a writer is, a, is without words. Um, but I'll live with that. Um, yeah, it does inform how I write because I know that there are certain things that can be acted and, and you know, and, and a lot of the writing that I do is, a, is people talking just bullshit. And so what's going on around them is what's important. And, and so I'm, I, 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 I know that that's possible in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the framework of creating the piece because, you know, the actors can create visual ideas that... Um, I remember years ago I was talking to a very good friend of mine who's s since gone, but he, uh, he was a uh, director from Germany. And we were talking about playwriting and, and, uh, dire and directing, and, and he, we were talking very seriously about all this. And then he stopped me in the middle and he said, you know that just the two of us have been talking this whole time very seriously about playwriting, but Ken has been making popcorn the whole time. <laughs> There are a lot of directors who wouldn't do that because they'd go, well, why is there a person there making popcorn? But that's actually, I mean, it was just a, not maybe not the best example, but it's an example of things that could be going on and can be going on while a play is happening. Like dishwashers is a good example. Dishwashers, I don't know if you, any of you saw the dishwashers, but di dishwashing is very important. It's probably more important than anything they say because it's the process of dishwashing that creates their language, that creates their feelings, that, you know, the, the drudgery of it is what's important. Ironically, in England when they did it, they hired an actor who decided he didn't want to wash dishes. <laughs> so it kind of didn't work because that's the whole point. <clears throat> uh, I heard a couple of people react to, to this play, The Dishwasher. So, yes, you, as you say, the themes of loneliness, isolation, a, a sort of absurdist sense of humor are, are you know, sort of your, your take on writing for the theater. But if you compare Dishwashers to Girl in the Goldfish Bowl, like the, the set that Ken did, you felt like you were down in some hellish, claustrophobic basement, even though it was a big, big set, and that that um, poor boy was sort of looking at his life ending if he stayed a day longer in that terrible place with those men who had dead-end lives being dishwashers, right? So th you, you say you're looking for new things to do, but your, your body of work, if we can use that fancy term, is... Um, like really varied, don't you feel? Yeah, but it's always kind of like the, the uh, I like big visual metaphors. I like, the, I like the audience to feel that they're going somewhere that isn't r r naturalistic, uh, like more like a dream kind of. Um, and that's why I, I like collaborating with Ken because he can create those environments. And, uh, and uh, I was glad that he was able to work with Jackie because Jackie is directing the show. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> just, just talking about your, the, all the different sorts of things you've done. Right. So not even just saying like how different a play or, or a performance without words is from one that has text, but to say like how, how different some of your plays are from others of your plays, right? Some are very uh, contains like, you know, like vigil, the simplicity of vigil which is mostly monologues, right. uh, to, to plays that have many more characters, much more going well, on. Well, I think when I start, I feel like, what, and I think this goes back to what I, was, what, I, what I did as an actor, I think, what is a really interesting and challenging thing for actors to do, and what, or for the audience to absorb? So in Vigil, I had this idea that this guy just talk and she just listen. I thought that was a really interesting theatrical idea, so I guess one of the main things I suppose I do is I th 
think of things to fuck people up. <laughs> well, ta talking of what you just reminded me of was this uh, uh, really interesting experience that, that we shared of a play Morris wrote called What Lies Before Us, which was about a, a lost team of guys who were trying to trace the route through the Rocky Mountains to complete the, the um, CNE. Is that really right? The CPR. C yeah. <laughs> no. That's yeah. Yeah. Um, the CNE. Yeah. And, and so, so in that play, it, it, it's there, there's some pretty broad comedy in it, but it's also like um, like waiting for Godot if everybody dies at the end, um, and that play ends with the uh, he's called Cooley, like he's he's this Chinese worker who's with these these two. Um, like British twits, uh, one Scot, one Brit, and he, he's kind of keeping them alive, and he's kind of fending for all three of them, and they end up dead in the tent with him, and he, for the first time, really speaks, and he pours his heart out in a, I'm going to say, three-minute, maybe even five-minute long monologue. Does that sound about right? But it's entirely in Mandarin. <laughs> so... So it, I, I loved it. Um, it. It was profoundly confusing for audiences, but, <laughs> but it, it also said, here's this guy you've been looking at and laughing at, and he's got a life entirely well, you know, outside you know what's of You funny? Yeah. That play was confusing for audiences when it was done, but if you did it now, people would go, oh, it's yeah. about colonialism, because yeah, yeah. it was just a little bit ahead of its time. Well, it, it was also interesting because we did the play in Toronto, where it had, had a, like a good enough reception, and then we took it further and further west, going to like Winnipeg and Edmonton. And in those places, um, that we, I'm from Edmonton, and so so is Morris. We we were playing the play for people who had grandparents who, you know, arrived before Alberta was a province, who got out there on the railroad or who worked on the railroad. And so, the the further west we got, the more it seemed that people actually. Had had a personal connection to it, and it was therefore it was more poignant, perhaps. But it also there's much more response. It, it was much funnier for people as we got further west. I'd forgotten about it. That depends part. too. Like um, I found this very interesting. We were doing a production of Lawrence and Holloman in in Vancouver, and it was kind of disastrous. We were doing it at the Arts Club, and it was like in a 400 seat theater, like it's a cavern, and we did, and it. I mean. I would say kind of disaster. It was fine, you know, but audiences were kind of like, ah, you know, whatever. And then one day they decided they wanted to do it as a radio uh, play. And so they got us into a studio at CBC and, they, and it was a very tight little room with about 100 audience members. I've never heard laughter like that. So, it, and I thought, I think it's the venue. I think right, the, right. it's just, there's certain shows that work in certain spaces. And that's why I've always liked the Tarragon, because it's kind of the perfect space for new work. Because if, if the show can be bigger, it'll go off and maybe be bigger. But in this place, it's small enough that people can focus on the writing and the, and the you know, the, the minutia of it, or whatever it's uh, you know, it's it's so, so I, I was I just found it very interesting that the same play done by the same actors had a completely different reaction in a different space. And I saw it again in Toronto. Somebody did it in some little tiny place in Kensington Market and it got a great reaction. It was like a little tiny. So, um, so that that I don't know how many of you know Lawrence and Holloman, but there's there's like to, to me a really a delicious joke about it because there are two actors. If you look in the program, there are two actors, and one of them spends the entire play going, "Someone's tricking me. Someone's <laughs> someone's being mean to me. Who could it be?" <laughs> right? Uh, and you feel like in a bigger space that the the guys yeah, being yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. into each other's yeah. lives just doesn't have a chance to. No, I think it's just yeah. Right. Okay. So you mentioned that as an actor who now writes, you think about what would be like the most enjoyable, the most exciting, the weirdest thing to ask actors to do in, in this given moment. Um, this is the first of your shows at the Tarragon not directed by you. Is that That's right? That's right. Yep. And what's, what is that like sitting in rehearsal, sitting in the audience? <laughs> well, I'll be, on <laughs> I'll be honest, it's painful. Um, I mean, Jackie's a fantastic director, and she's doing most of the things I would do, but she's doing some things differently. And, you know, all, all directors are control freaks. So 
you sit thinking, oh, I don't do that, I don't do that, and then, you know, but it's like that's the route that we decided to go. I wanted to sit in the room and be a writer and to take that director hat off for once and just focus on the writing. And, but it's hard because it's all integrated in rehearsal. It, the writing is integrated with the acting, with the movement, with the direction, with the, with the pacing. Everything is all integrated, so it's hard to disassociate yourself anyway. Um, you do have opinions about how the show should go, about what the pacing is, about how you know people should deliver lines or how you wrote them. Mm -hmm. You know, this is sometimes funny because the actors are supposed to make, be on a journey of discovery, you know, working on the piece, and then every once in a while, one of the actors would say, "Just give me a line reading, Morris. How do you how do you think that's said?" And I'd say, oh, "I'll say it like this," and they go, "Thank you. I'll say it like that." Um, but mostly, it's a it's a journey about the actors discovering what's in the play. Uh -huh and how to make it work for them, because they're the ones who have to do it. So you had this fantasy that it would be a relief to just sit at the back and watch someone else struggle through the process as director? And that mostly was borne out. Oh, it did? Yeah, yeah. Mostly Jackie had all the shitty work, and I didn't have to do any of it. <laughs> uh, she had to deal with the psychology of actors, which can be tricky. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because actors have questions, and some of the qu and you have to be able to parse whether the questions are personal or professional. Sometimes they get in their own heads, and it's understandable. And we both we both actors, we know what that's like. You can get ahead of yourself or behind yourself, you know. And the, it's a part of a director's job to kind of like be in the room as the kind of uh, parent, <laughs> as it were, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you're not the you're not the most mature person necessarily in the room. Sometimes you're not. You're, sometimes you're the least. But you're the person who has to get people together, understanding what the play is and what and how each other are working together on it. And that's very tricky and very that takes some negotiation. You have to mm -hmm. be a bit of a psychologist. Mm -hmm. it, I think you'd also do if you're the playwright in the room, yeah. right? Having yeah. been in that situation yeah. many times, and know and know when to shut up and to yeah. step away because sometimes you just have to let the actors do their thing. It's part of what theater is. Theater is giving material to other people. To take over, and so you know, I know that. I mean, I know I've watched my own plays uh, go in different directions I never imagined. I I remember when we were working on Vigil in uh, w in San Francisco with Olympia Dukakis, very famous actress. Who um, I, I was I was nervous at first about giving her direction. It, later on, it wasn't, but at the beginning, you know, because she's a very famous actress. And but watching her develop the character was fascinating because she did it like no other actress I'd ever seen. She did a whole different track. And I just sat there thinking, and I think because I was a little bit nervous about her, I let her go the further in the direction that I w maybe would have. And it was fascinating to watch. Uh, so you're, you're always surprised and sometimes very pleasantly surprised that the direction actors will take your work. And that was a pleasant surprise? Yeah, she, it was she a went to a place you hadn't expected? It was a very pleasant you, surprise. She didn't stay in bed for one second. Oh, wow, wow. That character was originally written to be in bed most of the time, and Olympia wasn't even in bed for the first scene. And she just, she couldn't, she, and she would yell at me about things. She'd say, I'm not a cipher, and she would, you know, she really challenged me a lot in that play, and that made, it made the play better. But you, you, did you rec direct that one? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Um, so she wasn't in the bed very much? No. She, it's, it's a role where the, the lady very often seems uh, uh, almost comatose, and, and actors famously fall asleep a lot in that role, right? <laughs> At least in rehearsal. Jo Joyce Campion used to. Yeah. We used to, uh, uh, Brian Tree and Joyce Campion did it here, and sometimes we would just say to Brian, just keep going, because Joyce would be like, oh. <laughs> so what was she doing out of the bed? What, like, what? Just shit. Like just, just like tidying up. Yeah, yeah, I'm oh. doing stuff, which made total sense. Also, you know, there's many different ways to do that show. There's many different ways to do every show, but she found a path that was quite fascinating. Um, but she was a piece of work. I mean, the first day during the reading, she completely redrew Ken's original costume drawing. Wow. <laughs> in front of Ken. And. What the funny part of that was, in the end, we put her in exactly the same costume that he drew, and she loved it. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, we, we've done very well so far not doing any plot spoilers about uh, with Withrow Park. Um, it has no plot. It has no plot, that's why. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, and you're cool, we're not going to do that, right? No plot spoilers? No. Um, okay, so we've, we've got the, your, your themes <clears throat> um, of loneliness and isolation. The, it, these are also, as you say, older characters 
with older actors. And the, the cool thing about uh, getting older in this profession is that, as you say, I know these actors, I know their voices, I know not just the what they're going to bring to it, but I know the kind of um, ditches they're going to dig for themselves, right? Then I can help them get out of those. But it must also be k kind of wonderful to have three very seasoned, very capable, funny actors helping your play to have its first life. Yeah, I know mostly, I know mostly they're asking questions about the play that are integral and, and meaningful and have to do with the work and not to just to do with how they are feeling. Mm -hmm. That they're focused, uh, that their energy is right, that they know how to spend their time in rehearsal, um, and that they know how to find a pathway through a part, and if they can't, they seek help, but mostly, you know, they're, they're incredibly reliable. Yeah, and they're, they're good. They're, it's, it's been a, the, the preview period, it's, it's always fraught with all kinds of different things. You never, we, the, the first preview had some strange things going on in the audience, um, a, number, a number of interesting Yeah, troubles. someone brought in a little baby. Yeah, if, 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 three, uh, uh, a sort of babe in arms and a, like I'm going to say, two-year-old and a five-year-old and the, 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 the Well, the worst part the was that didn't like it very the much. women, <laughs> the, the woman who had the baby, she, the baby didn't like the dark, so in the blackout, she would turn on the phone for the baby. <laughs> and you're like, mm, okay, well, yeah, there goes that blackout. But anyway, yeah. no, but the, so that always happens. But but it's been it's yeah. been a, a pretty it's been a like a successful, happy, yeah. healthy, process. A very very right. very fantastic. Very, yeah, um, th there's also uh, again it's not a plot spoiler, but we, we talked a little bit about the, the the malleability of the tarragon space in terms of how it can feel based on the design that comes in, and you'll see that Ken's Ken's design makes the space feel much bigger than it is, which is really appropriate for the piece because it takes place in one of those great big old houses in the south of the Danforth around Withrow Park, right? Mm -hmm. That's a park that you walked through a lot when you lived in that neighborhood? Yeah, I lived in, we lived in Riverdale for almost 20 years and I walked there a lot. And did um, the, um, the, the idea for it, did it come walking through the park? Not no, really, no. No, no I, just, I just wanted it to be a park, like a lovely city park, that's all. And so I just call it Withrow Park because that was the park I knew. Um, there are lots of parks in the city, you know, with lots of lovely houses surrounding them. Um, but it was kind of perfect because it's a perfect kind of like middle class neighborhood. It's not Rosedale, you know, it's not Parkdale, it's, uh -huh. it's, a, it's Riverdale. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it is kind of um, gentrifying in lots of yes, areas. Yes, it but, is. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, Heather, I'm keeping an eye on the clock if you're here. I was going to say that, that we can, thank you, um, we can um, uh, take questions in a little bit if, pe if anyone has anything they, they'd uh, like to ask. And failing that, we can, we can do uh, cooking tips and recipe <laughs> ideas. <laughs> can it, uh, D David and I cook together a lot. Well, David does the cooking. I, I don't really, I just watch. No, no. <laughs> no, he does much more than the dishes. He's a, he's a very good cook. <laughs> Um, all right, so also the, the idea that you say is a theme that runs through a lot of your plays about people isolated in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's just inability to connect to the other people in their lives or feeling misunderstood and that kind of stuff. In this play, aging is a, a specific well, thing. Well, when I talk about isolation, uh, the most important thing, I think, is that we die alone. So no matter how many connections we make, no matter what we do with our lives, no matter how many people we know, we're, we are alone. That is the last moment, there's no one else. And so for me, that's always been kind of like, I've always hooked into that and I've always hooked into that as a life issue. Like what is life and how do we deal with life and how do we live and how do we make our lives into something meaningful even though mm, they're really not that meaningful. Uh, so it's, that's always been, that always drives the show, the, the, the the stories that I write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what, what did my life mean? Well, yeah, I often cite my father, I, I'd seen the program even, my father, when I, was, when I was six, my grandmother died, and it was a big, giant Ukrainian funeral, like probably one of the last truly old school funerals. It was like uh, nothing, and when you're six, so the first night she was laid on the dining room table, all night and wow. there was a wake the second day there was a 
uh, a march down country roads with banners and then the big giant church thing with a choir and a burial and a visitation and I, my father actually picked me up and got me to kiss my grandmother in her coffin and I think when you're Was six his mom or your, his mom yeah. yeah I think when you're six you're like my god this is the best thing I've ever seen <laughs> this is like <laughs> I, this is awesome. I mean, that choir, the noise, the banners, the ceremony, all of it was just like, I was just in heaven. And I think it just stayed with me, the whole pageantry and idea of death and, you know, it's so, you know. But I know this because I read your, your program note. He also said, she's sleeping now forever or something that's like right, that, right? right? And you yeah. thought that sounded lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to tell a six-year-old? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Um, do we have any questions at this point? Yes. You keep mentioning vigil, and I keep laughing out loud, which speaks volumes. You said nothing about the incredible acting, I thought, of Martha Henry in that. That's right. Martha was in, Martha was, or Martha acted with uh, Brent, Martha, who passed last year. Um, she was incredible to work with. She was a, uh, she was, uh, she was just devoted to that show. And, um, but her and Brent were so weird in rehearsal um, because Brent brought his dog. And during rehearsal, even when they were running a scene, even when they were running the whole show, like and we were trying to get a timing or whatever, every time Brent brought in a tray, and there was several times in the play of food, the dog <laughs> would walk up into the scene. And I would like, I, I was the only one who was upset. Martha would be like, oh, hello, baby. And they'd stop the whole show and they would talk to the dog for like five minutes. And I'd be like, okay, guys, we got to move it here. Like, we got a show to do. But that was so Martha. And she also reinvented that part. I mean, she jumped out of that bed and she was very active. And, and uh, uh, I think for me as a director, when I worked with Martha, I was a little bit more stuck in my head about how that part should go. So I was kind of like, I had little battles with her about it, but they were always, you know, they were always respectful and everything. It's just that, you know, uh, you do, you do have to negotiate with people, especially someone like Martha, who was such a great actress. You have to, I act, I also, I acted with Martha in Pal Joey. Uh -huh. And I didn't know who Martha was. I came from the West Coast and I never heard of her. And everyone knew Martha. Mm -hmm. All I knew was she was really slow. <laughs> and she would sing like, bewitched, bothered. And, and I would be like, are you kidding me? You, could, you, could you pick this up? But she got all the, all the press. They didn't even mention me. I was so angry. I just was just infuriated that who this fucking actress who got all the press and I got nothing. And then, so for about a week, I was so angry with her. And then one night, I, one night I, on my way to work, I thought, I just have to let this go. I just have to, you know, let this be part of what this is. I don't know what it is, but I've got to stop being angry and I just have to let it go and enjoy myself. And as we were standing backstage, she took my hand and she said, Welcome back. <laughs> and I was like, oh my fucking God, how did you know? But she knew. She's pretty sensitive. Oh yeah, she was pretty sensitive. Um, so the, and your most recent production of Vigil was at the Belfry, and that, that was like just coming out of COVID. Oh my but, God. Uh, we had one night, it was the tech rehearsal. I hadn't seen a run of the show because I didn't want to go to rehearsals because they were worried about COVID and I wanted to stay away and it was, it's a very tight rehearsal room. So I hadn't seen it, I hadn't seen it, uh, someone else directed it and I, so I hadn't seen anything. And then the main actor, the, the actor got COVID and then he got over COVID and he came back to work, but he, the night he gave, came back, he uh, had a throat problem. So he asked, could he please just do the movements and not say the words? He's the only one who speaks. And, and in the middle of teching, she fell off the stage right, right. in a blackout and had a concussion. 
We only know that because when she fell off the stage, she said, okay, let's keep going. What happened? And we were like, you fell off the stage. She said, no, I didn't. So we took her to the hospital. <laughs> so I watched, the first time I watched the show, he was acting the whole thing without any words, and there was no one in the bed. That's and the show I saw. How was it? Very good. I still <laughs> I thought this could be a sh I still had three notes yeah. for the director. <laughs> Good idea for a new play. <laughs> yeah. The, it strikes me that that, uh, what's, what's his name? The guy. Anton Lipovitsky. No, 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 sorry. The character. Oh, Kemp. Kemp. Yeah, so, so if, if Kemp is sort of like waiting out the time till she dies in her bed and she hasn't moved for a long time, it strikes me as like really dramatically interesting if at some point later she gets out of bed and she's all active. Is that kind of how that worked? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, good. Yeah. That's good. Because then his his plan is not working. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Here's one. Uh, I'd just like to say that the playing of your deliberately everything that you shot because it isn't upstaging or something. I'm quite with it on my own, and I have lots of acting going above, below, and I, and I always think of your shot. I feel like I'm at home with your shot. <laughs> I'll tell you. I love your shot. Uh, Thank you. I, um, I wrote that play. I, I wasn't intending to write that play. I was trying to write a play, and I was really frustrated, and I'm very sensitive to noise. And we were living in Vancouver at the time, and I had earplugs and, a, and, a ear, and the industrial ear things. And I was trying to write this other play, and I thought, oh, this isn't working. And I, I walked downstairs to wash my hands, and I looked in the mirror, and I thought, well, that's the play I need to write. <laughs> Who is that guy? And so I just started to listening to things, and I talked to Urjo. I said, I have this idea for a play about somebody who hears too much. And he's like, oh, keep writing that. And so I wrote it and sent it to him. Yeah, the uh, forced perspective set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love that because we had an idea. The, the forced perspective means it's larger. It, it, it's in perspective, so by the time it got to the upstage part, it was very small. He couldn't get through the door. But Ken had found a little tiny pair of jeans that were on a little tiny chair, because it was in perspective. But we, did, we loved this bit where Randy would run upstage to get the pants on and grab these jeans, and they were too small. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. What is your idea for a scene? Like, how do you translate from not having the dialogue to the movement to get the story that you want? Well, you have to create a you have to create a, a work list and a scenario for each scene. It's almost like a uh, you know like a storytelling moments. What has to happen in the scene? For example, oh, they arrive at the train station. So these are the things that have to happen. He has to say goodbye to his father, his lover, his brother and then he has to get on the train. These are the events that have to happen. So at least you have a, an idea what is supposed to happen. And then with the music or whatever you're using, then you create an idea of how that music fits with that scenario. So in some cases where I had chosen music for the show, I chose pieces of music where I thought I heard parts of that action happening. And then I put that music on we worked with that music on the movement and tried to match the movement to the uh, tried to match the movement to the music that was happening at the time. In this latest piece, Frankenstein, I still had I asked the composer to write. I told him how much time I needed. I I would guess. I said, for example, train station. I need probably two minutes. What do you need? I need it to sound like he's on a journey. I need it to sound like people are saying goodbye. I need the feeling of it to be transitional and uh, so he wrote a piece and then I put the movement to it and I work with experts who like I worked with a choreographer who's really good with dancers and I worked with a, a movement expert uh, who I've worked with a lot who knows how to shape actors uh, give actors shape in terms of storytelling moments and perfect them so the audience understands when they're looking at it what the story is um, but that's all part of the challenge, because for me, part of the fun of working on shows like that is how difficult they are. Uh, that's what I love. I love how difficult it is to be in a room and try to f sort that out. And as long as everybody in that room is 
on board, board. That's when it's fun because people know how hard it is, but they're there because it's hard and because they want to figure it out. So your, your plot summary, sort of your outline, yeah. for want of a better word, that's sort of like the raw dramaturgy of the piece. Yeah, right? and then I get, sometimes I'll get Ken to draw storyboards, so e what each scene might look like just to help the design team, just to help you know the costume person or whoever, and also just everybody, the actors, to say, this is what the scene kind of is going to look like. This is, the, you know, this is kind of what it's going to look like. But it's so much fun for if the actors are engaged in this process, because you come into a room on the first day and you say, I have nothing. <laughs> I, have, I have this, and let's go. And then actors just, I think they're so uh, excited by the terror of it that they just work really hard to make it happen. And it's, it's, a, it's magical. It's a really great experience. And, and it is, I, th I think you can imagine, terrifying. Because in, in the case of uh, Frankenstein, the most recent um, play without words, there, there were some workshops beforehand, right? You tested out a couple of ideas, uh, worked with the, the composer, <clears throat> talked with the uh, two choreographers about how you're going to bring that world to life. But then once they got into the actual rehearsals of it, there was not a bunch of extra time given to it because it had never in any way been created. No. No. It was start from nothing and we'll see you at opening, right? Well, not only that, but the workshops had all been based on doing it at the Tom Patterson, which is a oh, long, yeah, yeah, narrow yeah, right, theater. Right. And then at the last minute, the head of Stratford called me and said, we think we're going to do it at the Avon. And I'm like, oh, OK. So it's a Prost theater, so it's a completely different look, a completely different feeling. So all the work we'd done kind of had to be thrown out the window. We had to start again. Yes? Would you consider doing that with a live band, with a kit orchestra, or maybe two or four? Well, I would love to, but it would, it would, be, uh, it would be kind of expensive, because yeah. uh, you'd, you'd have that many extra people to pay. Um, but also, I mean, it, it would be fun to do, but it couldn't be any larger than, um, at one point, uh, the, the head of National Theater, uh, uh, NEC in Ottawa, uh, uh, who I know very well, he talked to me about doing Overcoat again with a live orchestra. Wow. Uh, but I'm like, that's 55 pieces. Oh, four people. oh yeah, yeah, no, no, that way you could do, but still it would add expense. But no, yeah. I would love to do that. Yeah, four pieces. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that would, yes, thank you. They would have to be very good. <laughs> if, if you didn't, here's if you, a question, it was you, about... If you've Sorry. got the money to produce that, I'd be happy to yeah. do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the question is about doing such a piece with a live orchestra. And, and when the, the few times that I've been able to do um, like a, a play with someone performing sound live, whether it was sound effects or, or a musician, it, it is, it's very different. It's amazing as opposed to having something recorded that will always be exactly the same, to have somebody sort of feeling how this day is different from last night and that, you know, responding to what the actors are doing. It's really magical. But as Morris says, it is prohibitive from a lot of theaters because The other thing cost. too is you'd have to be on a click track, if you know what that is, because the actors have to respond to at the same time every night. And if the music changes even a little bit, they don't really know where they are or what they're doing. Their speed changes, the whole story changes. I know I ran into this when we did, we made a film of The Overcoat, and the CBC Orchestra played with uh, Mario Bernardi, the conductor. And uh, I had to give him notes, if you can believe it. I'm giving this, this conductor notes about the music, which I felt ridiculous, but I was saying, you gotta pick that up because that's not how it goes. But even then, the, tr the piece was tricky to do with that, with that new music, because the timing had changed. So yeah, you'd have to really, the, the performers would have to be very disciplined. <laughs> I think so too, and it would, uh, as you, 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 you say that you respond to the uh, fearful challenge of it, and that would be like a, another degree of complexity, yeah, yeah, so you would yeah. like that. Yeah, as I say, uh, if you've got no money, let's go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we just have a couple minutes left, so if there's another question, um, here's another one. I'm going to go back to the beginning when you were talking about process of ideas and things, I'm just wondering <laughs> what comes to you first, whether it's the story and then you shape characters to the story, or the characters come first and you go I think it's ideas first. I think I hear something or I t was talking to somebody or I feel something like um, recently I've been talking about light reflection and how light 
what, that, and, and how it has to do with quantum, quantum physics and how what we see is, uh, what, what exists is, is we've created in our, in our vision. It doesn't necessarily exist the same for every person, which I find kind of fascinating. So I'm kind of, now I'm thinking about ways to make that into a show. Uh, because I also like the idea that if I could create this these, this shifting vision, I could use it for color and light and movement and and uh, you know. So I'm just playing around with that. But that I think the ideas come first, like just a just a spark of something I've read or something that really interests me or makes me sad. That one too, you know. Like um, I know when Ken's mother was dying, we were in the hospital and. The reason I wrote Vigil was because there was a woman in the next bed whose nephew was supposed to come visit from England, and the and the candy striper, whatever you call them now, the work the the uh, the support worker, she came in and said, "Your your your nephew called, and he said he can't come. Sorry." And 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 you think, okay, this woman's dying, and she started crying, and I I walked out of the room, and I thought. This is the most horrible thing I've ever witnessed, and I thought I have to write something about this. I mean, it's a comedy because I can't really write anything else. And what else is there to say? You have to, you have to write a comedy, otherwise it just—it's too dark. Yeah. In, in addition to actually writing a whole bunch of plays, Mars is constantly coming up with ideas that, you know, for whatever reason, never get realized. For example, uh, he, he had this idea uh, for a play that would happen without any actors, just an empty room. I still think it's a good idea. Me too, me too, me too. Damn. And so, so there's a whole story being told by what happens, like that you hear or, or see through a window or stuff. The whole story happens outside. But I, I remember like, a, you explaining that to a couple of different artistic directors <laughs> yeah. watching their faces. <laughs> <laughs> I said to one of them, I said, if you could make the audience cry because a teacup broke, you got something. Yeah. But he was like, no, we're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I think we're at time. So I just wanted to thank you all again for the great questions and for um, spending some of your Sunday afternoon with us. And Thanks. if you're going to the show, please enjoy it. Thanks, Thanks Amy.